So we had a bit of a delay because of the uh, display adapters, but we're going to be fine. I have 45 minutes, so I'll try to squeeze in. So um, my name is Mattia, uh, and I'm from a company called Smartcat. We do uh, data engineering and data science consultancy. And we were based in Europe and US. And today I'll be talking about real-time an analytics with fast data stack. Maybe you heard about this stack called Smack Stack, but uh, I'm trying to call it fast data stacks because it explains better what it actually is. So uh, the question first th that comes to, to, to my mind first is what was the most precious resource in the past 100 years? So you would probably say oil. And what is the uh, mo one of the most precious resources today? No, water. But who said data? That's, uh, you're almost correct. So uh, data is the one of the top uh, uh, five resources today. And uh, you can see a lot of uh, things happening on the market. Uh, you saw the uh, LinkedIn get acquired by Microsoft. They, they were basically acquired because of the data they have, not because of the product, because the product, you know, sucks. So uh, since the data is the most important thing today, uh, we try to do as much as, uh, with, data, uh, with data as we can. Uh, and uh, us humans being humans, we store everything. So you probably know your attics, your garage, everything's full of stuff you never need. Uh, and one of our problems is uh, because we store everything, we need to store always more and more and more. But then we figured out that we can leverage the data we stored across the years, and then we can gain some insights and get, uh, get some better knowledge uh, and understand uh, uh, all the events that are happening and that are going to happen and uh, understand how to react. So uh, data basically, sorry, data basically helps us as a civilization, progress as a civilization. So if you look at all the things that are happening now, uh, travel to Mars, artificial intelligence, uh, and everything is based on uh, training uh, the model based on the data we collected, but then making it uh, 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 understand the, the things that are happening right now and the, and the reacting uh, in real time. So that's one of the biggest uh, problems we see with data patterns, data mining, all the techniques that we, are, uh, we, we got used to. Because uh, we're used to uh, just storing a large amounts of data somewhere, then having some of the data analysts, uh, BI, or whatever people that know how to dig and, uh, dig and mine this data, get some of the information uh, from, from the data itself, and then help us uh, react and help us improve our business. So we figured out that uh, this uh, approach is good for us because we can understand how our business works and we can improve our business. But the problem is that uh, this is probably done a couple of days later or a couple of weeks later or even months. So we needed to understand how to react uh, at a given time and how to react uh, in the moment when we receive new information and then make our business even better. So it became obvious that uh, the elephant in the room uh, is the problem of reacting in a timely manner. So whenever new events come in, we need to react in a timely manner, not uh, data mine them later in the, the uh, upcoming weeks. Because when we uh, get to the point when we understand what's going on, that information, uh, that information came in too late. So. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, move all our data analytics and uh, BI and everything we do, we, we're trying to move it as close to the source as possible. Source in our system is usually a data pipeline or data, data fire hose that gets all the, all, all the data in our infrastructure. So this proven to be a, a bit of a problem because in the last 10 years we're, we've been tackling these issues and trying to uh, find a way and make an arch architecture that's uh, uh, scalable uh, and fault tolerant and also uh, elastic enough to support all our requirements uh, to run the analytics on the live data we have. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we're not going to miss, of course, is the ETL. Uh, there's a movement called No ETL, which is trying to explain why ETL basically is bad and why you should move to something else. Because uh, ETL itself, uh, uh, extract, transform, and uh, load is a process which is cumbersome. Uh, you can lose the data in the process. Uh, it's not, uh, <coughs> sorry, it's not uh, idempotent because uh, if uh, you have some uh, failures, you can have data duplication. Then your uh, end results are not correct, but, but you are working in a correct sense. 
Uh, of course, tools working with DTL are expensive. It, it can cost a lot. It decreases the an, uh, an throughput of the system. And when you start using these tools and you try to move them to the place where we want to run analytics, it becomes really complex. And your, the, your whole data pipeline becomes uh, probably uh, less, um, less interesting to work with. So one of the things that came to, uh, to the, the whole scene a couple of years back is uh, the lam uh, Lambda architecture, which uh, Nathan Martz explained. Uh, he worked for, for Twitter at, at the time. He explained uh, the Lambda architecture as uh, something that solves this problem to a certain point, because solving, solving the, uh, the, the, the issues we had a, a couple of years back and moving to the uh, new ways was probably impossible. We had to have some transition. And Lambda architecture helped us understand the problems and pinpoint where we want to do and what we want to do, do uh, throughout our data pipeline. So if you look at this, um, this is a typical Lambda architecture data pipeline where you have uh, the data ingestion on the beginning. Uh, there you have the speed layer, which is the uh, raw data being streamed into your uh, database and enabling your real-time views. So this layer serves your real-time queries. So you can see all your latest data, but it's not processed. So you have the second layer, which is a batch layer. This works asynchronously, but it's not real time as we want it to be. So you're collecting data in batches, you're applying algorithms to it, and then you're, uh, fin uh, you're coming up with uh, batch views, which are also referred to as materialized views, where you can see the results uh, of your algorithms being ran on, on your data, and it also serves to uh, serves your queries, but it's not real time. It's still not enough. So the next thing we came up with is our uh, streams. Is any of you working with streams right now? Awesome. So uh, the thing is that we moved all the calculation, even uh, calculations, even uh, closer to the uh, data firehose, and uh, we got to the s to the point where everything streams. Every everybody's doing streams. All the technology have their stream implementation, uh, and it's becoming a bit of a mess. But the good thing is that it's, it's enabling us to do what we want at the point where we want it. But moving to the streaming um, streaming category, we needed to do some changes, and uh, the most important changes are architectural changes because you need to. Uh, make sure that your, the uh, architecture can support uh, uh, these technologies and these approaches. And one of the uh, architect uh, architectures that we are most uh, familiar with are monolithic architecture. I'm not going to get into microservices, so this is not that talk. Uh, the monolithic architecture is uh, usually something that's uh, based on three layers. One is data persistent, the, s the, the other one is uh, the, the querying layer, and on top is the visu visualization layer. So we're used to this. Uh, it's somewhat easy to implement. Uh, we know how it works. We understand. Uh, we know all the problems. You can even use Stack Overflow to find the solutions, and et cetera. But we wanted to make this uh, so that uh, we can support uh, our goal, which is real-time analytics. So we came up with the something that looks like this. This is one of the reference implementations of the uh, SMAC stack or fast data stack uh, architecture. So you have a completely asynchronous and fault tolerant uh, architecture, which enables you to have uh, both data ingestion pa paths and data visualization paths. Uh, all are implemented in technologies which are completely asynchronous. Uh, you can scale. Uh, you can gain performance by scaling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're mo more flexible and you're more, more elastic with this approach. But I do agree it's complicated. It's complicated to a certain point where you, uh, if you're running to implement your MVP or you're trying to uh, validate your idea, this is, not the, the, this is not the approach you want to take. You're probably going to uh, make a monolith uh, architecture, just make sure that it works, and then move, uh, move on to something like this when uh, you have requirements for more users, more throughput, you have more data, and you have more problems. So, but what's the, um, what are the pros and cons of this approach and this type of the architecture? So the pros, and the pros are that you're flexible. Everything that's message-based uh, adds you a lot of flexibility. You can add more uh, things to the messages that are coming in. 
Uh, the performance, of course, uh, if you can scale out, the performance is unmeasurable compared to the uh, monolithic single instance applications. Uh, the computation power, anybody doing anything with uh, GPUs here? Awesome, one guy. So the computational power grows because then you can scale your infra infrastructure, you can uh, leverage more and more hardware, and that, uh, that's something that, that you can do with the previous approach. And of course, scaling, I mentioned that a lot of times, Scaling is the number one uh, reason why we do this. What are the cons? So uh, when we solve the problem of, uh, of placing our, our analytics where we want it, how we want it, running it uh, asynchronously, we have the problems of complexity. Uh, as I previously mentioned, mentioned if you never had a, a, an infrastructure like this, it's probably going to be hard starting with it. Uh, security, of course, uh, any distributed system suffers with uh, security problems, and it's hard to adopt. So, but we're here to talk about fast data stack, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, and the fast data stacks are five technologies. Um, so, we have uh, a Spark Masses, Akka, Kafka, and Cassandra. Anybody working with any of these? Awesome. Um, so, oh, did, uh, was any any of you guys uh, on the previous talk? Okay, so the previous talk was about uh, a bit of a deep dive in Cassandra. I'll just give you a, a brief overview. So uh, Apache Cassandra is a database we like its market, and uh, it's something that we've used for a couple of years, and it's, it's better proven. It, uh, the performance is awesome. It's scalable. But the, 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 the database itself and the concepts are based on the Amazon Dynamo and Google Bigtable. So Amazon Dynamo uh, uh, gave its... Uh, uh, full tolerance and scalability, while the Google Big Table gave its uh, partitioning and the, the way the data is stored to Cassandra. So it picked the bo best of both wor worlds. And basically, it's a share nothing architecture. So um, all the nodes uh, have the same. Uh, 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 sorry, all the nodes uh, share share the same. Um, uh, requirements in the cluster, when they uh, uh, form a cluster, all the nodes do the same things. Uh, all the nodes uh, have a piece of data, piece of replicas. So uh, if one node or more nodes go do goes down, you don't have a problem. Uh, it's fast, it's scalable. Uh, it's a distributed partition store. What that means is that data is basically stored as a partition. Uh, and if you look at the data layout on the, on the disk, it's a map of maps. So. Uh, it's really fast uh, for reads. It, it, it can write uh, with really, really high request rates. But the problem is that the data modeling is basically requ uh, request-based. So you need to know your uh, data access patterns in order to data model. So there are some problems with the database itself uh, solving all the use cases you have today. Uh, it's a native mul multi-data center. So uh, adding more DCs into a cluster, it's easy. You can. Uh, uh, deploy, the cl deploy clusters anywhere. What we see now, um, as working in the consultancy, what we see now is a lot of companies are choosing to go with deployments in multiple um, uh, hostings, which means that uh, they have a DC in uh, Amazon, they have a DC in Google Cloud, uh, they have a DC maybe uh, in, uh, in Azure. So all these DCs combine into one cluster and you have probably the 99.9% .9 availability, even 100%. So uh, what does it mean that it's a masterless peer-to-peer -peer replication? It means that uh, there's no master in the standard sense. Uh, there's no write-only master. There's no uh, read-only replicas like you have with the standard uh, databases or anybody tried to shard MongoDB or PostgreSQL. You probably had the same problem. Uh, the thing is that uh, there's a notion of master only for the incoming requests. And for each request which lands on any of the nodes in the cluster, that node is a master for that, for that request. Um, of course, why we love it, it's unlimited horizontal scaling. Uh, we were at the Cassandra Summit two, two weeks ago, and uh, it was really in, in, interesting to see Apple running uh, 115,000 nodes of Cassandra. And the biggest cluster is over 1,000 1, nodes. So it's really scalable. Okay, so the next, next technology is stack is uh, Apache Kafka. Uh, Apache Kafka is a distributed partition uh, partitioned uh, uh, replicated commit log. 
Uh, they like to say that it's a uh, message queue uh, redone because uh, it looks like a message queue, but it uh, somewhat works differently. Uh, it's cluster-centric cent design. It's made to work with a master and slaves, but they're synchronized using Zookeeper, so you have a master, f a master failover. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, it's fa uh, fast. Uh, the, the good thing with Kafka is that you can get your message processing down to milliseconds. So this is not something that's common with most uh, messaging brokers. Uh, and it's really important by design, it decouples the data pipelines. What it means is that uh, producers and consumers have nothing in common. So you can have as many producers as you want, and then you can make some consumers which uh, ingest data uh, at, at their own pace. But if we, we want to go fast, that's not the way we're going to do it. Uh, data replication is uh, uh, naturally implemented, which means that the partition data is also replicated to, uh, through the cluster, so you have failover scenarios. Uh, and there's a notion of consumer groups. Uh, consumer groups are something that's uh, between the, the standard uh, uh, polling uh, message queue and the publish subscribe. So uh, the consumer group is uh, basically a merging of these two. Uh, and it enables your uh, consumers, uh, which are placed, placed in consumer groups, to always receive uh, one of the uh, uh, data replicas, which are uh, made for, uh, which are sent for this partition, for uh, on this topic. Uh, and it's a, a really interesting concept bec because, as I said before, uh, consumers and producers have nothing in common. But of course, if you see a problem with your consumers. Uh, consuming all the data that producers are producing, you can add more. You can uh, put c consumers in consumer group and add uh, uh, replication and scalability. And uh, it's a really interesting technology. Of course, they have their own uh, Kafka streams implementation. Uh, that's something that came out with uh, 0.10 Kafka version. Um, and it's worthy to look at because uh, you're doing all your uh, algorithms uh, on the data stream itself. Uh, the next technology in stack is Apache Spark. Is anybody here working with Spark? Great. Um, so what is Apache Spark? Apache Spark is a general purpose data processing engine. What that means is that uh, it enables us to uh, run our algorithms or data processing or data transformation uh, techniques on the data itself. Uh, and it uh, provides us with a data abstraction which enables us to um, format and prepare the data before we start running the transformations on it. Uh, and data is abstracted in three ways. Uh, RDDs, uh, Resilient Distributed Data Sets, are the oldest uh, data abstraction, and they were um, abstracted in the version 1.6 uh, with data sets. Uh, data sets are distributed collection of data. Uh, they, they provide new API, they have better performance, and they, enables, uh, they, they enable us to ease, uh, more easier, work more easier with the data. And of course, data frames. Uh, data frames are uh, data sets which are organized into named columns. So uh, people uh, uh, developing Spark are working a lot to enables, uh, enable us to use the typed uh, data and type structures. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the most important things with Spark is it does batch and stream processing. Uh, stream is in quotes because um, Spark streaming is not actually the uh, real-time streaming implementation. What the streaming with Spark does is it does a micro-batching. The micro-batching is uh, defined as a small time window and then all the data that ca comes in, in, in this uh, time window is processed. So you can get really low uh, uh, in the means of latency, and you can get uh, really uh, small pieces of data with the fr fragmentation with small uh, uh, time windows, but it's still batching. Uh, and the Spark architecture is uh, we have a main Spark engine, which uh, provides us to work with uh, Spark modules, which are Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, MLib, which is uh, interesting for machine learning, and GraphX. And this is a simple. Uh, yeah, uh, when you download it, it screws the lines up. So this is a simple word count uh, uh, example how it, it is easy with three lines you can do a word count in Spark, loading the, the text file, uh, doing a, a map, uh, uh, map and reduce, and then saving that to the, the, to the file. So basically all the work is done in this one line. 
yeah, one line. Uh, and Spark streaming itself ex is uh, easily explained that you have an input data stream, which then goes into a Spark streaming module. And then, as, as I said before, it's basically doing uh, micro batches. And then uh, you're doing your transformations and actions in your Spark engine. And you're getting the batches of process data. And uh, in a bigger um, environment, uh, it looks like this. You can have any data source. There's really a lot of uh, connectors and implementations so for data sources. Uh, the, uh, in the Spark streaming, uh, you can also uh, use leverage the Spark SQL. You can use uh, uh, MLib to leverage any uh, already implemented machine learning algorithms. Uh, and then, of course, as data storage system, there's a lot of uh, data storage uh, systems out there available. Or you can return to your message queue and then uh, do, any, uh, do, uh, do, uh, um, do something else with your data. And uh, this pretty much explains the, the Spark streaming. I'm not going to get in too, too much into detail because each of these technologies is probably a talk for itself. And uh, the, <coughs> sorry. the last thing is Apache Mesos. Uh, Apache Mesos uh, is a server, uh, server kernel with a resource management API. Uh, this is something that uh, abstracts our hardware. And it enables us to have uh, hardware as a pool of resources instead of having the uh, hardware notion as instances. Uh, and we can, uh, we can leverage any uh, resource in the pool using the uh, executors and uh, scheduler. Uh, which means that we, if we have a job that we want to execute on a certain uh, uh, hardware requirement, uh, then the s uh, scheduler is going to reserve that uh, pool of resources to us and then execute the task, uh, the task on that. It's fault tolerant, it's scalable, uh, it has native container isolation and Docker support. This is a pretty good thing because uh, everybody is today running in Docker. Uh, and this, uh, this gives us a complete uh, architecture for our fa fast data stack. So if we look at the arch architecture uh, diagram I showed you uh, a minute, minute ago, uh, this is the, the reference implementation of the Smack stack. You, uh, it's part of the Kilowatter project you can find on GitHub. Uh, it basically shows you how easily you can implement these technologies together and give you uh, all the uh, availabilities, uh, availability, scalability, performance, fault tolerant, everything we talked about. And uh, I'll just go briefly over it. So there's an uh, ACA cluster, which has an HTTP uh, module uh, for the data ingestion. Uh, th this way, you, um, you write your a uh, API in uh, ACA. Uh, and then all these uh, requests are forwarded as uh, ca Kafka messages to a Kafka uh, pr producer. So you're uh, ingesting your data into Kafka. Uh, and then from Kafka, you have connectors uh, that uh, pull the data from topics, and then you, uh, you do uh, Spark streaming jobs on that. And after that, you save it into Cassandra. So there's a Spark uh, Cassandra connector, which is developed by Datastax. And uh, the uh, Spark Cassandra connector is uh, something that enables you to leverage the, the Spark uh, workforce on your Cassandra data. And if you deploy a Spark cluster on top of Cassandra cluster, it has a notion of uh, uh, data location. Uh, that means that, uh, uh, that uh, the jobs are actually executed where the data is. And there's really uh, low amounts of data running across the cluster, so you're not uh, trashing your uh, network. So uh, while doing the, oh, sorry. So while doing the uh, Spark streaming, you can uh, uh, do the aggregations. Uh, you can also save row data. So this resembles the uh, Lambda architecture, but it's uh, really on the low level. Uh, and then when ev everything's stored in the database, you have a real-time uh, querying layer, which is also implemented in, in, uh, in ACA. Uh, all the requests are forwarded, forwarded to the uh, ACA, um, ACA cluster, which uh, then queries using the uh, Spark Im implementation. Of course, again, leveraging the Spark Cassandra connector. And then the data is being uh, returned with uh, the ACA uh, remoting pipelines. So that's about it. So, um, okay, I sp sped it up a bit. <laughs> uh, the thing about the fast data stack is uh, 
It provides us a pretty good solution for uh, a lot of the data processing uh, use cases. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's easily uh, scalable and fault-tolerant stack, which uh, is something that's given out of the box and uh, the architecture is uh, made that way. Um, it's, uh, it enables us to have a unified cluster management uh, for the hetero heterogeneous loads. Uh, th this means that uh, whatever type of the load we have, whatever the request rates we see, whatever type of data we have, we have no problems with, uh, with the cluster management and sizing. And uh, of course, it's a pretty good bridge between data engineering and data science. So uh, I think that fast data stack is something that enables us from the engineering side to provide a pretty solid, uh, solid base for uh, any data, uh, data science implementations because there was a pretty big gap uh, between the data engineering and real-time uh, work and the data science. So now with this stack, we can easily implement the algorithms on the real-time uh, real data and then leverage the, uh, the whole architecture, but also run our data science uh, work on the data. Uh, it's a production-proven component. So all the components in this stack are pr production-proven. There's a huge open source community. Uh, they're all uh, uh, actively developed uh, uh, project on GitHub. Uh, and uh, it really has a large community and high number of committers. So, are there any questions? Yes? Uh, the whole stack or what sorts of use cases? So it's uh, mostly used in IoT and finance because of the type of the data and the type of the data uh, access and all the analytics you want to do on the data itself. So uh, there you can use it to probably any case, but the question then is when we get back to it, uh, is the architecture complexity worth it? But mostly IoT and uh, finance. Yeah, the, there's a difference between MQTT uh, brokers and implementations in Kafka. The, I think that there's an active uh, project with uh, MQTT implementation on top of Kafka. Uh, I did work on a project where we used uh, Mosquito as an MQTT broker, but the problem is that the, uh, they solve different use cases. So MQTT brokers enables you to have uh, an industry standard implementation of message protocol, but Kafka itself is more of a data ingestion uh, and data pipeline. So it, you can have an MQTT in front of Kafka where you collect all your data from your sensor devices, from your whatever, and then you uh, ingest it into Kafka to, uh, from MQTT brokers, you ingest it into Kafka, and then you can have the data pipeline, and then you can add streaming to it, you can add uh, analytics to it. So I wouldn't say that they compete too much, but they're solving different use cases. And Kafka itself is pretty good because of the low, low latency. But the question is, what are you going to read from that? Technically, you can, but I never saw no, nobody did do it. Yeah. So technically, you can. You have implementations in, uh, for clients, Kafka clients, in tons of languages, so you can probably uh, do it. But it's it's not for that use case. Yes. Um, I have a blog on our website, you can read it, that's a uh, Kafka introduction, but I uh, emphasized on r uh, differences between uh, uh, RabbitMQ and Kafka itself, because uh, they're, uh, as it's a similar uh, question to the MQTT problem, uh, they're solving different problems. But Kafka itself uh, is different, so b b different because uh, it uh, decouples producers and consumers, where uh, typical MQP implementations are uh, su uh, pub subscribe uh, protocols where when somebody publishes a message, somebody answers to that or, uh, uh, or processes the messages that, that it receives. Uh, regarding performance and scaling, I would always say Kafka 
but MQTT is something that's much easier to start with and to work with, and uh, it's simpl simpler for us to understand because it's similar to the things that we're, that we're used to working with. Does it answer the question? Awesome. Anybody else? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I do a lot of reads uh, from uh, Kleppmann, and I did meet, meet him in uh, 2014 at ApacheCon, and uh, h that's a pretty, a pretty reasonable question because uh, if you set your uh, uh, infrastructure and if you, uh, if you do the implementations the right way so that uh, everything being done is idempotent, you won't have any problems. And the good thing with Kafka, as you mentioned, is that you can always, as a client, you can always rewind to the po position where you probably want to uh, rewind all your data and then rerun all the uh, algorithms and all the processing on that, uh, on, on that data. Yeah, there's no automatic help. Yeah. So it's the same thing with uh, any uh, AWS or Azure technology, everybody's used to just uh, having connectors and connecting uh, everything graphically. No, in this, in this sense, no. You have to do a lot of work. Anybody else? Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>